This is an Inside Jerry's Brain call on Friday, March 15th, 2019. We're already halfway through March. I'm in Portland, Oregon, where suddenly we almost don't have to wear a jacket anymore. It feels like spring is about to spring. The leaves have not yet cracked open, but they're, you can feel them. They're like, there's this pent up energy, perhaps this pent up abundance, one could say, uh, that is on its way. So I'm excited to host a call on uh, abundance mindset, but in relation to profitability. And uh, I will do a little bit of background to just open up the topic and then say what it, what it means and uh, uh, how it fits. And then uh, we'll just open the floor as we usually do. Oh, good. I just saw Mayanka, Logan are here. Uh, April's on. Excellent. And everybody, when you first come into the call, you're muted. So learn how to unmute yourself in the Zoom if you'd like to jump in. And I'll do a, just a little bit of opening of the subject here. Uh, and then we'll open the floor and anybody can jump in. It's a free for all at that point. Um, in case you're wondering what, what we mean by inside Jerry's brain, uh, I'll do a little bit of a tour. This piece of software that I am now screen sharing is called The Brain. As you can see up on the left here, it says The Brain. And um, it's a mind map. Uh, it's a mind map that I've been filling for 21 years. So there's 21 years worth of things in this mind map. Uh, and the place I've pointed to is today's call, which is uh, 1903 means 2019 March, because I always do year month, because that way they alphabetize nicely. Uh, Inside Jerry's Brain, Abundance Mindset and Profitability is our topic. Uh, but there was an, an earlier Inside Jerry's Brain call, uh, which Shay Fehrenbach was our, our guest on, because she and I had been going back and forth on this just broad notion of abundance and what, you know, what's up with, with abundance. Um, so this is the link. This is actually a YouTube link to uh, that particular call. And if you were in my brain and you clicked on this link, it would send you off to that video on YouTube, which is kind of fun. And I've connected it to the broad topic of abundance mindset, uh, which is under abundance. And there's a whole bunch of things under abundance, like wealth and uh, the abounding river. I don't remember why I put that in. Here's something I kind of invented. Scarcity equals abundance minus trust, which I think will come up a bit in our call because uh, these things are actually related in funny ways. Um, and then I just noticed that uh, abundance mindset was not connected to mindset. So that gives me an opportunity to show you how this brain thing works. If I, if I grab any one of these three little circles, which are the only ways that one thought can connect to the other, if I grab the top one and drag up and let go, I get an open little space. And now I can say mindset because I know that I've got mindset uh, in my brain. And I know enough to find this one over here because I've got a lot of mindset in my brain apparently. Uh, so this is mindsets, which is the general topic of mindsets. Uh, and the W next to it means that there's a Wikipedia page associated with it. So if I click on this, I'm just, I'm just going to do it now. If I click on it, it will launch my browser over to the Wikipedia page about mindset. So that's, that's what, what the brain thing is. And the reason I call these calls inside Jerry's brain is that we just want to have a nice conversation about an interesting topic with you all interesting folks. Uh, but we'd like to have it with this added context of the brain, of like a mind map that I've been curating for a really long time so that we can put into the conversation the kinds of things that I've already sort of discovered and curated, but also so that during the call, I can add things to my brain that we all put together new ideas that we come up with, uh, things, that, uh, uh, things that sort of make sense uh, in, that, in that way. Um, and I, so that's, that's kind of his background on the brain. Any questions on that? We're good? Oh, good, Mr. Homer's here. Excellent. Um, good. So abundance sounds like a good thing, right? It sounds like it's always a good thing. And it turns out that it's not always a good thing. So I'll go actually back to, to screen sharing because I was just starting uh, in the shower this morning as I was thinking about this call. I was like, okay, okay. I need to uh, create a thought, which I did, called When Abundance is Harmful. And for example, um, American food policy favored creating cheap carbohydrates and really messed things up. Uh, so we made it, we subsidized farmers, we made it uh, after World War II roughly, there was a policy uh, initiative to make sure that corn and soybeans and things like that were insanely cheap. Uh, so all sorts of policies were instituted and industrial farming was favored. And we made it really, really cheap to, um, to, to create very, very um, 
sorry, to create carbohydrates, sort of uh, corn, starches, other sorts of things. And uh, as a result, we have an obesity epidemic uh, in the US. So I think I will click on obesity in the US and connect, uh, make a, a bit of a causal link. Um, so now I've just connected US obesity is caused by overproduction of food. I can actually make that link here. Uh, and then here's a bunch of, of articles about obesity, particularly in the US, connected to a bunch of articles about obesity. And so there's a piece of this, which is that abundance isn't, isn't always plainly a good thing. Um, and then there's another piece of this, which is about um, uh, basically fake abundance, which is, um, let me see where I put it, abundance mindsets. Um, I know it's under fake stuff, but I, I put it under, oh, pseudo abundance, that's what I called it. Let me actually um, edit this thought to be called pseudo and then fake abundance so I can find it easily next time. And so a different kind of abundance that isn't necessarily good for us is that um, we have the appearance of abundance. When you walk into a store, there are aisles and aisles and aisles of product. Um, but when you go and turn the boxes or the jugs around, you discover that they're really only made by a couple of companies in many cases, uh, like the detergent aisle has probably 50 different detergents made by two companies. Uh, the cereal aisle has probably 50 different cereals made by two companies. So in many cases we have functioning duopolies or monopolies on a lot of things, yet it looks like there's a lot of abundance, partly because marketing is creating this perception of difference between products so that different people will buy different things thinking that they're getting <clears throat> something that's abundant. But in fact, um, uh, in fact, it, it isn't really necessarily abundance. And here, uh, here, I think we can get into really interesting philosophical debates, which I'm looking forward to, because, because on, the, on the one hand, if you go to an old East German store or to a store in Venezuela right now, and you see that there's nothing on the shelves, um, that's the opposite and it's not desirable. But, uh, but I'm trying to figure out, like, what is the balance between those kinds of things? And then I'll give one more, um, one more example, which is um, uh, because we have a couple of guests on the call from India, and I will, uh, I will ask you to correct my history here. Uh, but basically, uh, India was a whole series of kingdoms and fiefdoms and, and uh, so forth before the British Raj shows up. But it was mostly self-sufficient for food and clothing before the Raj shows up. The, the British Raj basically illegalizes the loom because the British Raj try, wants to turn India into a plantation where it will create cotton and other sorts of goods, ship them all the way over to England where they get manufactured in Manchester and other sorts of places in the early Industrial Revolution, and then ship back to India for purchase. So Britain wants India to no longer make native fabric. And one of the reasons I think why Gandhi, uh, as uh, one of the symbols of his uh, movement, was spinning his own cloth and wearing cloth that he had spun, was a reminder of this. He was reminding people that India had, in fact, just recently, just not, not 300 years before, not 200 years before, been self-sufficient in these sorts of things. There was an abundance for everybody. Um, so that's a form of, of abundance turned into scarcity on purpose in order that capitalism, in this case mercantilism and early industrialism, might thrive. It was done intentionally to, to both create raw material sources and a, a big market for products. So um, that's a, a, a different kind of tangle of, of abundance and scarcity introduced to reduce abundance. Um, and then I'll just give one more little, little story. Um, in the early factories, uh, and in, in the trades before the factories, if you were a carpenter, for example, you had a right to pick up and take home the things that fell on the floor. So if you had cut a piece of wood and there were a couple little, little pieces that, that came off or other uh, extra pieces, um, that was yours to take home and it was just a side benefit of the job. That was a form of abundance, of a sharing of, of production uh, in the early uh, industrial age that went away. And what we have now is, uh, in some cases, inspections of workers as they enter and leave the factory so that they take nothing with them. We have sort of a, a denuding of this, this sharing of assets in different ways. So I, I, will, I will pause there and stop the screen sharing. And then I will apologize because as we start talking, um, 
I will occasionally take over the screen uh, and not trying to interrupt you while you're talking, but trying to add to what you're saying or collect up what you're saying and, and add it into the brain context. So um, having thus lit a tiny fire, I will invite anybody who'd like to, to ask questions, uh, then throw in comments, take the conversation anywhere you'd like. And remember that mostly you are muted right now. So Jerry, I heard you uh, say in previous calls, etc., that uh, something to the effect that abundance is not the opposite of scarcity. And I think uh, that needs to be understood if we are talking about the mindset of abundance and actually drop a few pins about what really is abundance and what are the mindset elements beyond uh, a concept of uh, saying abundance. So, because there's lots of confusion on abundance mean, meaning act, excess. You just pointed out just now, you know, that in capitalism, it, it has a different connotation. Then there was this, uh, there's something in the chat which talks about abundance underlying the disposable society. I think Ken has talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, probably uh, there's some value in trying to trace where this mindset has come from. Why, did, why has it actually become a mindset? And then if we want to reverse it or we want to mitigate the ill effects of the lack of abundance in terms of thinking or in terms of mindsets, what are the things that we need to do? Because I think that would segue into uh, the topic of today, which is you know abundance and in relation to profitability. Because then we need to also dwell on this word profitability and see what profitability really means and what does it connote? Is it the money that I, uh, for work that I do and I put into my pocket and my pocket swells? Or is profitability something larger than putting into my pocket and then disposing it off in the way that I want to as an individual. Beautiful, thank you. And um, I'll start by answering, but I think other people are probably starting to answer your question as well. And I want, I want to hear from everybody else as well. And thank you also for adding in the original premise of this call, which is how does profitability fit? Um, but, but there's a, a couple interesting works on, on the topic of plenitude, on, on sort of sufficiency, having enough, uh, whatever that means. And, and the, the place we have arrived at is that capitalism, and I'm going to be a little extreme here, but capitalism needs us never to have enough. It, it, capitalism requires us to be purchasing a lot of things so that the capitalist engine can keep making things and selling things, et cetera, et cetera. If we should decide that we're, we have enough and we have long lasting things that we can pass down to other generations, uh, you can see, um, uh, Patagonia had a really interesting ad campaign a couple years ago called uh, Have Less Stuff or Buy Less Stuff. Um, and uh, what is it? Don't buy this jacket. Here we go. This is uh, the Patagonia. Here. Patagonia had a campaign called Don't Buy This Jacket, which was in contrast to throwaway culture, the disposability of our culture. And they were trying to say, hey, buy something good. We make good stuff, so buy our stuff. But pass it down or bring it in and we'll fix it or whatever else, right? That was a way of doing it. And this is actually a form of profitability with, um, with enough, with plenitude. And I think that, that this conversation about the opposite of, of scarcity is not abundance, it's, it's something different. And I think it, it's somewhere in between this, these notions of enough, um, when, how do you know you have enough? And uh, plenitude of there being sufficiency without overabundance without waste, without uh, things like that. So let me, let me just start with that and I'll, I'll come back to the profitability thing, but let me start there and see what, it, what everybody else thinks. Hi, Jerry, how are you? I am well, Tom, how are you? Good. Uh, just a couple different thoughts on what connects a couple of things you mentioned earlier where you're talking about the obesity due to the abundance of carbohydrate calories that are made cheap in the industrialized food supply, and also the cotton. Um, when you view these things not as food but as product, this is what tends to happen. And how do we have a different mindset as to what are the things that we want to have? Um, there's, is food something that should be a product? You no, know, is food something that should be a right? I just put a link in the chat there that 
Uh, I don't know it very well, but um, this uh, Jose Luis is coming up with a, he's trying to get people to think of food not so much as something that should be commoditized, but reconceptualizing it as something that can be abundant and available to everybody. Um, if we think of it as something that we're all entitled to. And so I'm just trying to figure out how this idea of when you, how do you think of these things? Is it abundant or not abundant can really be determined by whether or not you think of it as something that we all need and want and provide to each other? Or is it something that America has, like for example, the food supply, we subsidize our tax dollars in the United States, subsidize the growing of cheap corn uh, so that these companies can make a bigger profit and our tax dollars subsidize the turning that corn into high fructose corn syrup so other companies can make cheap products. And so the idea is the food was just a mechanism for moving money around. That mindset creates this scarcity idea or this abundance idea. And I just was wondering how other people think of that. Um, and I, and I think, I think a piece of this comes down to how your own picture of human history looks. Um, because uh, some people believe that we used to be hungry all the time, that way back when, when we were tribal and, and sort of moving around the land and, and scrounging around for nuts and berries, you know, the hunter gatherer lifestyle was not abundant, was actually a, a, a case of hunger most of the time. And I'm of exactly the opposite uh, point of view, which is that most cultures around the world had to work very little to make enough food, to have enough food to, to live really quite well. And that people who understood how to live on the land and take, and, and take advantage of the land's ebbs and flows. So right about now is when there's a run on the river and all the fish come up to spawn. So if we set a couple traps with stones and there, there's a, 30,000 year old weir on a river in Australia that the Aborigines created. And a weir is basically just a, a trap. And it's open most of the time, except when, you know, when the fish would run, they would go seal the bottom of the weir so that fish would come in the top, the, the open piece up river, get caught in this little stone fence, basically all it is, stone ring, seal the top, take out a lot of fish, process them, dry them, do whatever so that they'll last a little longer and go on about the day. And when the Australians show up, they look at these fishermen just kind of reaching in and pick up, and they're like, these people are so lazy. That's the commentary written down in journals by the Australians who first show up. And what these people are doing is they're just, they're living in an abundant world. So you don't have to work really hard to survive and eat. And if you have a variety of things that you're eating, you're healthier, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can put a couple of book titles in here and I'll show them also in my brain as we go. But I'm saying all of that about history because the notion of food as a commons, as a thing that we all as a community just create and have a right to and, and get from the community work, I think comes partly from that history, from that place. And we have substituted commons completely with the idea that there are scarce resources that we are allocating through markets in economics, through this system that apparently is the best way to allocate scarce resources or something like that, right? Because that's one of the definitions of economics and it's one of the things we think that that markets uh, do for us is that they allocate things really well, but it turns out it's far from the only allocation model. So that's, that's, that's my own, my own take on, on these sorts of things. But um, what do other people think? I'd, I'd love to ask about the last thing that you just said um, about what alternative allocation models there are, uh, because it, it seems that that is where the entire question rests. Um, so be curious, do you have, a, apart from markets, um, or uh, apart from, uh, say, perfect commons, which we know can be easily abused, what sort of alternative potentially abundance sort of maintaining allocation models do we have? So, for example, and this is going to sound uh, long ago in, in, in a tiny place, but in the Algonquin tribes of the American Northeast, uh, it was a mat matrilineal tribe, and basically uh, everybody would go and find things. They would, there's a whole story behind this about how most of North and South America and most of Australia was under active human management so that things were pretty abundant to find. And as you moved around, you could get things. But whatever surplus there was that wasn't eaten right now was put in a longhouse that was kind of the storage house. And longhouses were sort of the way they lived. They had some for storage, some for families. And the elder women of that particular tribe had the say to which things came out of the longhouse and were given to which families or which people. 
So that's an, that's an actual allocation mechanism. And it has to do with human relationships in a small, in a small village context. But there's, there's no reason that can't be fractal and that can't replicate in many, many places in, 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 at many times. Um, and that's just one example. And I'm not an anthropologist or a sociologist, so I don't have that. And, and I try hard to collect these kinds of stories because I love them. But that, that's just one method of, of many. Um, and there are, uh, and, and Doug is going to jump in right now and perhaps offer another. So another piece of history that fascinates me, uh, Aristotle and Plato used the word economics, meaning eco-home nomos management or something like that. And they discussed what would happen if you had a well-managed estate. And the view was a well-managed estate would of necessity produce a surplus. Then the question is, what do you do with the surplus? So Aristotle says the last thing you should do with it is spend it on things. It should be used to create leisure in order to study philosophy and politics. So here you have a purpose for the, the production of a surplus, which legitimates that it's possible to have that kind of conversation. What's amazing is that model of intent about surplus moved into the early Christian community and the idea that the estate was God's estate because he had given it to humanity in order that humanity would produce a surplus in order to create meditation and prayer. So the, the Greek culture moved into Christianity. We lose that entirely because uh, historians look at the Latin translation of the Old Testament which talks about management and not about economy. But the word economia is all through the Greek version of the uh, New and Old Testaments. To me, what I like there is, is that it's possible to have a meaningful conversation about what you should do with the surplus. Exactly. And I'm pointing here to a, a blog post and a video that I did some time ago that plays off this, uh, this difference. And I'll, I'll put the link. It's easier for me to fetch the link if I uh, stop sharing. But I'll, I'll put the link here in our chat. And where I went with this particular video was um, ecology and economy both come from oikos, the household. Why are ecology and economy so often at odds? Why are these things uh, fighting each other? Uh, when they're both trying to manage the household. And my, my, my theory in this little video is that they both have a very different idea of the household. Most economists, by far not all, but most economists think of the household as me and my immediate nuclear family fighting other households for resources and for work and for money. And ecologists think of the household as this pale blue dot, basically this fragile planet, which we must manage together, and that that's the household. And what they're fighting about is this notion that like, if you think that the household is the planet, then we're all in it together and we better make sure the planet survives. If you think the household is just me and greedy behavior is okay because this invisible hand is going to make markets perfect and, and solve for things in the large, which is, I'm describing a complete philosophical belief of, of you know, libertarian or other kinds of traditional neoclassical economists, um, then you would behave that way. So there's huge disparities in behavior depending on what you think of history, whose economic model you bought. And, and a lot of this is not stuff we actively think about a lot. It's stuff that we were born into. It's the community of birth where we absorb and are socialized into that way of seeing the world, that way of seeing history, that way of being. And we don't question it more often than not. We die before we question it. And when that belief system is challenged, we often will fight it before actually thinking about it. We will fight for it you know, we will, we will actively defend it rather than thinking it through and going, holy crap, we've been, we've been sitting here thinking something that's a little messed up. Um, why don't we change the way we're thinking? Jerry, do you um, believe that this is a, a common worldview across cultures, across uh, the world, or is this a very Western uh, view? I, I I'm, not talking a, I'm just saying this whole, the, the, there's this other play of individual versus collective, right? Mm-hmm. No, one very key, very key to, so one is the element of trust, but the question is that when you talk, talk about ecology and uh, economics and, and the way you illustrated it, that they are at uh, loggerheads with each other, right. uh, 
some something tells me that that also has to do with a very individualistic and me versus them kind of a feeling which is very very driven by uh, the conditioning of a culture in which you're brought brought up in a world view that you get to con- get conditioned to accept and believe i completely agree um and i'll bring in a, a couple other things here um as well on that because um piece of this, um, oh shoot, where was I about to go? Oh heck, I just lost, I had a really nice thread I was gonna throw in. Um, Oh, I'm just getting it back. So a piece of this is, um, goes back into the history of philosophy and I am also no philosopher, but it really goes back to how did these ideas perk up that uh, the invisible hand, economics, all these sorts of things. And that, that can be a longer discussion. One of my favorite books here is The Great Transformation by Carl Polanyi. Who is, who is describing in 1944 the shift from pre-industrial society into early industrialism. And he talks about how it breaks a lot of things and what the, the economists of that day think and how they're working. Then we roll way forward to the advent of communism and socialism and attempts to create you know, regimes. And what Western economists will point to is, look how terrible Mao and Stalin were. And, and here I'm going to bring in something entirely different, which is that even though Mao and Stalin and Marx and everybody else were sort of working toward a, a you know, the, the best for all kind of frame of mind, um, they were all working at it from a, what I will call a Yang point of view. So let me throw a different little crazy theory of mine in, which is that um, I'm borrowing yin and yang from Taoism, right? And in Taoism, and, and there's a whole lot of other stuff around Taoism, but just the, if I could borrow the core of it, yin and yang, uh, yin is generally uh, feminine, receptive, dark earth energy. And yang is, is generally male, active, out, outward, bright energy. And I will overload the two terms. For me, yang is also uh, paternalistic, hierarchical, uh, command and control, analytic sort of divide, divide kind of energy. And yin is organic, emergent, spiritual, social, connective, emotional energy. And in Taoism, it doesn't mean that men are yang and women are yin at all. It means that any entity, whether it's one human, a family, a company, a a society, in order to be healthy needs to have yin and yang in balance and in creative tension because the interesting stuff happens where these two things kind of meet, right? And so my own little amateur history hypothesis is that uh, somewhere between 300 and 3,000 years ago, yang won. And Yang didn't say, well, let's come on, yin, let's go make a society. Yang said, yin is heresy. Anything that sounds like yin should be ignored, put aside, suppressed, destroyed. And so when we got to the era where philosophers and economists and whoever else were thinking about how do we organize a society for collective good, they thought about it from a completely Yang point of view and they invented something that was paternalistic, hierarchical, controlling, and very easy because it was a pyramid, when Stalin, an ignorant peasant from the Republic of Georgia, decides he wants to take control because Lenin is dying, it's very easy for him to go kill people off and take over this complete pyramidal structure that is the antithesis of what your average syndico anarchist would basically recommend doing with exactly the same goals in mind of how do we get the most for everybody communally working together. And anarchism, was completely expunged from everybody's vocabulary because God, we can't have lack of control, which is what they thought anarchism was, when in fact it was an attempt to, to establish different forms of collaboration from the, from the roots coming up. And then in the West, we demonized socialism and communism. So you can see that playing out right now in the election cycle where uh, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez declares herself a democratic socialist and, and everybody's like, <gasps> And she's trying to normalize the word socialism a little bit again, because the Northern European democracies are all like democratic socialists and it's working reasonably well for them for years now. Why is it such a crazy thing? It's a crazy thing here because in the fifties and sixties during the red scare, we intentionally demonized these terms. So sorry to bring like eight different things in, but I I think this yin yang male female schism is a really big piece of what, what lets us today dismiss really good ideas because we've 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 sort of there's sort of layers of of taking away from 
discourse and from our ability to solve problems, taking away great ideas and great things that used to happen. And we don't study history very much, so we don't look at how people were. I happen to think that long ago we were really smart and we knew how to live in community on the commons. And if you look at indigenous traditions around the world, you find that everywhere. And then the reason I say 300 to 3,000 years is that 3,000 years is kind of, you know, the, 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 the beginnings of languages. And Leonard Schlein's book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, blames linear alphabets for some of this. And then 300 years is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when really we tore society inside out completely. The Industrial Revolution has insane, crazy effects all over the place. So um, let me go quiet and, and see what y'all think. Tell us a little more unbox commons for us, please. Um, <clears throat> so commons is sort of a, a foreign word a lot. Sorry, uh, Ishta, Logan, Mayanka, are you guys familiar with commons? Is commons a familiar territory for you, more or less? You're muted right now, so I can't actually hear any of you. Mayanka, you Mayanka, you're unmuted, but I can't hear you though. So yeah. Is your microphone plugged in? You're hearing us fine. Something else is going on where I can't hear your voice. Keep trying until you, until we like, still not hearing you. Shoot. Or use the chat. Or uh, use the chat, or if you want, um, drop out of the, the Zoom and come back in and see if it connects you better to audio, or do the, there's also a test inside of it when you can, when you log in, that'll test your audio so you can see, but we'd love, we'd love to hear you. Um, I can hear you, but I have traffic sounds, so I'm going to go back to mute. Oh, interesting. Excellent. Um, so, Logan, did, uh, Logan or Ishta, did you want to talk a little bit about what you've seen about the commons and such? Uh, I mean, very quickly, coming from a background, so researching in economics, very traditionalist notion of what the definition of commons are. Um, and the tendency to move towards seeing uh, commons as a particular type of good and the uh, which has a particular sort of public good delivery mechanism um, and the critical piece of this is we can learn from uh, how commons do things like deliver public goods how we create institutions to ensure that they continue to do so and how we learn from those to apply those to markets where markets fail in other ways to try and replicate the sort of public goods delivery where uh, the market itself uh, what it, that's kind of my my take on it. I'd be interested in in knowing if there's any really sort of different take and I would love to hear that too. I think there are many and I think Tom started us off down this path saying you know is food a product that should be sold in markets or is it something that comes from the commons how does that work and then Doug Doug is a professional economist herder he is a, a shepherd of, of economists I think trying really hard to help them change the way they see these sorts of things. I don't know, Doug, do you want to share anything of your experiences and on this particular part of the, the journey you've been on? And you're muted right now. There we go. Okay. Uh, well, what's striking is that economists get socialized to a vocabulary and a formalism that tends to avoid things that are social, emotional, uh, interpersonal. So you can't really refine economics from within because the leverage points are already missing which makes they've, it they've been they've been excised on purpose kind of as uh, like our discourse does not include those things because they're squishy and unmeasurable and if you take things like the commons uh which economists tend to treat uh, as an aberration uh, in an economic system uh, it came first that is we had the public the commons long before we had the private individual and uh, my understanding of the interesting word private is it's Latin from privatus, which means to remove from the public space. So it's already a, uh, a secondary uh, concept. And that, that the uh, private became the center of society rather than the commons is a long historical evolution that leaves us in a bad place. Completely agree. One of the things, uh, since I've got the microphone at the moment, that I think is in the background of this conversation is what is going to happen to the idea of surplus and profit under severe climate change? 
if you take the model that the population's increasing, but the ability to produce food is decreasing because places are becoming uh, no longer uh, agriculturally productive because of temperature change. So that we're going into a period that's gonna really test these concepts in new ways. Um, I think that's a, that's a really great point. And it, it has to do with um, also survivalists and other people who just want to go away with enough food to live for a while. But um, there's, there's a very nice argument to be made that increasing everybody's capacity and creating abundance everywhere is the best path forward through the kinds of traumatic change we're likely to see. Because if, if you have a lot and everybody else doesn't, you are not going to fare well either. So there's a, a whole series of issues there. I, I'd love to know which parts of this, um, which parts of this resonate, Ishta, for you and, and, and everybody else, and where, where would you like us to steer into this thicket of issues? Because I think we've put like 15 heavy things on the table, um, all of which I'm fascinated by, um, but I'd like to sort of serve this in a direction you wanna go, and we haven't gotten back to the profitability topic yet either, so I wanna head there as well. I'll just quickly jump in here. Um, I feel like I wanted to kind of dial back and which is why uh, I, I connected with Douglas's question. Uh, I wanted to dial back to the harms, uh, harmful effects of say abundance or an abundance mindset. Um, and I was just wondering what could we identify as the complementary pieces or piece to abundance mindset in order to kind of counter or cap the impact it could have. So for example, the way that we view the resources of the earth um, is as abundant in so many ways. Um, and what it's led us to right now is just um, devastating. So um, what, what are the pieces that we can identify as, um, say, counterparts or complementary to abundance? And then um, profitability, yes. <laughs> um, I love that. Uh, Mayank, uh, Mayanka, do you want to try speaking and see if we hear you? Oh, maybe you're not hearing us yet. I don't see, are your ears in? Now you're muted. I think she's not hearing us quite yet. Ishta, if you will troubleshoot with her. Okay, good. Um, um, I think I'm on. Success, we can hear you now. Yay. Sorry, I don't want to kind of barge in. So you can continue and I'll jump in in a moment. That sounds great, thank you, feel free. Thanks. Um, so let me segue, <clears throat> I'll just do a quick segue into what Ishta was saying, perhaps. <clears throat> so when we see the earth is abundant, has abundant resources, then there's a tendency to say, well, this is a, uh, an infinite source of uh, resources, so I can take away as much as I want and I don't need to replenish, etc., etc. That's the narrative that we've been hearing for such a long time. What's, what's very interesting for me is to try and, try and look at nature and figure out how does nature handle abundance? You know, I mean, so nature does handle complexity much more than human beings can. It's got that level of resources that it manages to manage. And yet it keeps everything in balance without all the characteristics we talk about, capitalism, greed, lack of trust, scarcity, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it would be very interesting to figure out, you know, can we get, pointers from how nature manages the abundance that it creates and how does it keep growing and how does it keep evolving because I think that's that's something that can, that we could really take a leaf out of for business and society that's my take away thank you I'm, I'm just showing here in my brain ecosystem services which is a tiny slice of what you're talking about Sunil um, but I, I love your question like how does nature manage abundance or create or, or handle abundance? And in some sense, there's another conversation to be had about personifying nature, about whether there's you know, an intelligent designer someplace who's sort of controlling this or whether these things just sort of, sort of emerge on their own in different ways. But, but one of the things that, that happened was we turned the commons and nature into a pool of natural resources to sequester and plunder. Uh, and there's a guy named Lee Anderson uh, who was, he died, but he was the, oops. Oh, uh, oh I've got a lot of things. Here we go. We are plunderers. 
<clears throat> so sorry, not Lee Anderson, Ray Anderson. I, mis I mistook his name, so I looked for the We Are Plunderers. Um, but he basically uh, was the CEO of Interface Flooring and one day said, came to a realization that, hey, we're actually plunderers. We um, should not be doing this. I'll put this link in our chat, which is a, a talk he did uh, long ago about this. And uh, oh, it's interesting. And I haven't, I haven't sort of looked at this for a long time. But uh, there's a lot here to think about in for our conversation. But let me go quiet for a second while everybody else jumps in and says what you think. I think Mayanka has her hand up. Perfect, please. Um, hi, sorry, I'm so new to the Zoom space. I am still learning the conventions. <laughs> um, thank you for this. This has been very interesting. I just kind of, on the topic of abundance, uh, wanted to ask two related questions. One was kind of, because you kind of brought up uh, Marx and kind of idea of kind of, uh, kind of, it reminded me of abundance as relationship to alienation, but more largely kind of how does abundance relate to a certain cultural fetish, fetishizing of choice and also related fetish, fetishizing of speed, because we are also kind of in a time where abundance is also met with kind of rapid development, you know, fast projects, everything needs to be done quickly overnight. And so there's also kind of abundance in a strange view of speed. So, you know, things kind of in that sense, condensing at the same time, expanding. And I wonder if kind of how that ties into these kind of larger conversations about in some ways, contextualizing um, the conversations about abundance. Love that. Thank you. And I love cultural fetishizing. I think that's, that's sort of a perfect encapsulation of a lot of what's happened here is that, is that we've shaped, we, some people before us, have shaped our cultural expectations, our cultural norms, our cultural goals. I mean, in, in, in you know, American Western capitalist society, he who dies with the most toys wins. Everybody should, you know, uh, it's the ownership society. It's a whole series of things. Um, and freedom of choice is considered one of the greatest freedoms, sort of like, you know, uh, to choose what you do with your life, to choose what you can purchase, to choose where to live, all those things, we absolutely fetishize them. Um, and speed has been created as a premium also. I, I, I like how you're adding that into the formula. And we deprecate slow things. So if you go study um, unschooling or interesting topics about alternative education, one of the things they point out is that we absolutely like, oh, 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 I have the answer. That's apparently the smartest kid in class is the one who is quickest with the answer. And that's complete nonsense. And um, so, you know, giving people time to actually think gives you better answers, gives you cooperation, gives you a whole bunch of things. So, so I think we've, we've absolutely fetishized all these things in the culture and the culture is busy reinforcing the values you've described, right? And that, that's, that's part of the problem is that the culture uh, leads there. But I, I, that's just my slice at it. Uh, Tom, Ken, uh, April, do you want to jump in and take a swing? And is Judy, is that you on the phone? Uh, sorry, who was just uh, jumping in? Ken, go ahead, go ahead, Ken, and then I'll, and then uh, Judy after that. Yeah, a question that's been, been bubbling in the back of my mind has to do with um, neo-Darwinism being applied to um, uh, economics. So I just sent Jerry a, a link this morning to an article about science and how uh, conservatives and liberals use science differently. They, they, it's a big experiment in confirmation bias. So if you're conservative, you look for things that are you know, in criminology and economics that are going to back you up. And there's been a, a, a huge usurpation of scientific fact to say, you know, we are homo economics, economicus, and we're not. You know, this just we're not built that way. No one is wired that way. No one makes those choices. But it holds court as the standard by which all these economic decisions get made. So how do we create a kind of uh, a we that includes everybody that we can start to make some economic assumptions about and begin to, to reform in economics? Because it seems like it, it's very much uh, an abstraction that comes from old dead white guys, basically. You know, I mean, there's, where is, where is the, the living structure? Where's the living heart of economics that guides the conversation so that um, we're, we're making wiser choices. I call them the pale patriarchal penis people. 
um, which I'm borrowing from someone from long ago, but it's memorable and quite funny. So. <laughs> Um, anyone else? Well, I'll jump in, Jerry, if it's okay. I Please, Judy, yes. I be on too long from car phone because I worry about the background noises around me. You um, sound quite clear. Go ahead. All, first of all, compliments to everyone for the discussion. It's greatly improved my transit experience. Um, but I think that, that this question, two things came to mind to me listening to the discussion. And one is how could we redefine abundance in a more organic and natural way? Because abundance is more in my mind about the availability of things than it is about the possession of things. And that concept of sort of the organic nature of abundance and nature as a model and what nature does for itself and how other species interact with nature is I think a fruitful area for all kinds of modeling of social experiences and other things. Um, and then I also think that this artificial definition of economics in a very profit driven mode, and I kind of dislike the word profit, although what you do with profits can be a very constructive thing. So again, it's how do we look at economics as an, a, a kind of a, normalizing experience, a way to measure value. I mean, we have a lot of things that involve economics, but they aren't necessary profit and loss centers. Although to continue to exist one level of subsistence at least, or reasonable ability to move to higher purpose tasks is re requires some type of exchange of resources or sharing of resources. So this gets kind of convoluted and I'm sure that I'm just mumbling about it and people don't, I can't figure out what to do with, right with what I'm thinking. But if we could explore and sort of tease out some of these zones, the organic area and the um, preservation of resources and sharing of resources and effective utilization of resources, and those could be natural or human, so forth. Those would be areas I'd be interested in. Super, thank you, Judy. Um, what you're saying immediately leads me to a, a funny solution that's sort of at hand, um, which is the, the sharing economy, strangely enough. And, and there's, a, a little, uh, there's a little phrase that comes out of the sharing economy, which is um, basically access is better than ownership. Uh, meaning if I can pull out my phone and press a little button and the car of my choice shows up washed and fueled and ready to go someplace and I don't have to worry about insuring it or parking it or whatever else, isn't that a better deal? And if I wanted to rent a, a, a yacht for only a day and not own a yacht and have all, you know, everything that goes around that, that you can see that apps on your phone and, and, and there's plenty of dark side to the sharing economy, but apps on your phone are a form of abundance um, that makes better use of those assets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think, uh, Judy, there's, there's kind of a practical answer to what you're talking about that's even at hand right now that doesn't require having people think differently because there, there was a, a comment a little earlier in the, in the chat, like isn't part of this about not caring what we leave behind to future generations and, you know, um, uh, old tribes used to understand that if they screwed up their commons, they would ha their offspring would have nothing left. So, so historically around the world, people really understood that they needed to leave things better than they were, and they, they were this, this notion of seventh generation thinking was relatively common, I think. Um, and somehow this capitalist brain worm that's eaten so many people's heads says, no, 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 your selfishness right now, your active selfish actions will lead to some magical balance. Don't worry about it. Because if we need regulation, we'll, we'll create regulation that stops the bad things from happening. And that that's a, a, an extremely common belief that is, has completely gutted this notion of thinking longer term, you know, intergenerationally uh, like that. So um, if we thought more like nature, more naturally, and I'm, I think I'm probably going in a different direction than you intended, Judy, um, we would also think, I think, longer term in these ways. Uh, Doug. Yeah, am I unmuted, I think? Yes. Okay. 
uh, first on nature. Uh, the way nature works is to breed to the limit at which point that it's met by predators or diseases or whatever and slows down. So it's an equilibrium that's actually quite uh, costly to the lives of the critters that are uh, in a state of equilibrium. Uh, I, I would think we don't want humanity to quite use that method of breeding to the point of uh, limits. Now, uh, with that, shifting over, we tend to, to talk about economics a lot and not talk about politics. But economics is a way of distributing decisions out into the environment, uh, into the population uh, through consumer choices. The problem is you can no longer manage the totality with that principle. Uh, the things that are big issues go unmanaged. And we don't like to think that because big issues lead back then to centralized government or centralized authority, monarchy, things of that kind, which might be where we have to go if we're going to do estate management in the sense that the globe is the estate and the real task for the future is managing the relation between the human species and the globe. Uh, I don't think you can do that in a decentralized way completely. It's going to require some centralized authority, and we're not moving in that direction. Um, just to take one slice of what you said, Doug, um, a friend of mine uh, from Woods Hole, Massachusetts, Andy Maffei, is trying to reinvent bookkeeping. So double entry bookkeeping dates back to Luca Pacioli, who was a, a priest uh, in, in Renaissance Italy. He invents double entry bookkeeping, which is what we do. But most companies keep multiple sets of books. And I, I don't mean necessarily, the, here's the books that we're hiding from the tax authorities and here's the books that we're doing. Some, of, some companies do that. But there's a series of books where we say, here's where resources went through our system. And we're accounting for, we bought this much coal, we bought this much corn, it went into this process, we shipped this much product. Then there's a whole different set of financial accounting. There's almost no, no except for where it's regulatorily needed, uh, accounting for um, uh, externalities. Basically, this is how much carbon we emitted. This is, you know, th these are the other things. And the system Andy is working on would register each exchange in a way that would actually model all these transfers. And he's very far away from having sort of a working system that we could sit down and use. But I love the idea that when you started accounting for uh, how things move through a system, that you could begin to then say, okay, great, we, we, we took this in, but it caused this externality, it caused these monetary flows, et cetera, et cetera. So, so to me, that's, that's a piece of it is that economists don't realize how impoverished a lot of their observation, they have a very tiny porthole into what's going on, but they think that that's the world in many ways, right? And then they use aggregate data, time series data to try to get to big conclusions. When in fact, I remember in my Econ 101 class when we got through externalities in about 15 minutes and I, I was like, that seemed like an important topic. How did that go by so quickly, right? Um, so, so we don't even really have a, a full system that we're studying, right? How, how, do, we, how do we get any place on these things? Um, I think Ishta, you wanted to jump in, and then Mayanka as well. No, so straight to Mayanka, please. You need that. Um, yeah, uh, kind of on a related note, um, not that we're bashing economists here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, kind of wanted to ask you also your thoughts around kind of um, abundance in some way also co-opting kind of the language of impact. And I mean that in the sense of kind of models around philanthropy or models around social change, which now prioritize, you know, kind of giving and generosity or necessarily justice. And here I'm borrowing from Anand Giridhar Das's um, Elite Charades of Changing the World, which I think is fabulous in this context. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are where kind of impact, social impact and different ways of doing good and like giving out money and redistribution is becoming about still doing more and not necessarily question about what to do less of or what to not do at all. And yeah, just kind of this new, yeah, just this new kind of language around doing good, which in a lot of ways is not at all questioning this kind of, um, yeah, just the kind of abundance mentality, which has created a lot of uh, harm, but also create a lot of waste, you know, so a lot of kind of material harm as well. 
Um, completely agree. And I, I think of the, the part of Anand's critique that wealthy people don't really like and that capitalists don't really like is that he's sort of saying to them, hey, you all love going to these, you know, uh, good, do good and do well reunions, as long as it means you can build some new stuff and own more things. But the moment we say that maybe you shouldn't have so much, you're like, no, 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 that option is off the table. We're not going to do that thing. But everything else is okay. And look, we're gonna have a great time doing good and look how many people we fed last week or whatever else. And, and very few people are sort of prying the hood off this thing and looking underneath it for systemic problems and, and for other sorts of ways of affecting the, the system as a whole. So I, I, I completely agree with, with your premise. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate that we don't look a little deeper because when we don't question these premises, we walk through this with bad logic. So for example, um, uh, the tragedy of the commons is, um, is basically a, a mind worm that has eaten <clears throat> um, a lot of people's ideas of how things work. And in fact, the essay, The Tragedy of the Commons, written in 1968 by a soil biologist named Garrett Hardin, um, is a stupid essay. Like he is not working from any un real understanding of commons. And he says, look, you know, you can overgraze, you over farm commons don't really work most of the time. And there's all these people who've critiqued the tragedy of commons and commons don't naturally happen easily, but Lynn Ostrom won a Nobel economics prize for her studies um, of the commons. And part of what we're starting to understand is that we live in the middle of a whole series of commons. And we're trying to figure out how do we manage commons together? So when you talk about what are the other distribution mechanisms, Logan, when you were asking earlier, what other methods are there? And I mentioned the Algonquin tribe and longhouses, this is the bigger idea. It's like, okay, smart people are trying to figure out what are the rules with which people can create lovely thriving commons from which many people can thrive and profit. And so let me actually go to profitability for a second now before we, and so we're at, we're, we're at the top of the hour, we're gonna go 90 minutes. So we have another half hour to talk, but we have yet to sort of uh, brush up against the, this whole notion of profitability as well. Um, and let me go back to our call topic here in my brain. <clears throat> there we go. Um, because one of my big questions, and I, I, have a, I have a thought in my brain called big questions I love to answer. So uh, how are we rethinking or renegotiating the social contract? What if we trusted you is my question from the last decade. Uh, but how do we build profitable businesses around abundance in the commons is a, is a huge one. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, my favorite example, my go-to example on this is IBM and open source software. And back when I started my career as a tech industry analyst, uh, a few too many years ago, IBM was the 600 pound gorilla in the market. And when IBM did anything, we all jumped. And I was an analyst in the market. I had clients who wanted to know. So IBM would announce some new thing. We would, we would write something up, a quick report, and we would FedEx it back in the days before email. Uh, and in email newsletters and websites, but we would FedEx this paper document to all of our clients and you know, as quickly as we possibly could. And then at one point it looked like IBM was going to collapse. They were, they're, they're, they were being undermined by Sun Microsystems and cheap servers and a bunch of other things. <clears throat> and at some point, a couple of executives in, inside of IBM um, went and started looking at open source software. And long story short, over the course of a couple of years, they basically adopted first uh, Apache, then Linux, then they donated a, a system of theirs called Eclipse to open source. They turned it into open source software. They basically bought into the new commons of shared software rather than the proprietary way they approached software before that. And it saved the company. And then they started making two, three, four billion dollars in service revenues on top of shared open source software. So, so to me, uh, the story of, of, of IBM and open source software is a really terrific um, example of how this actually works. So Linux distribution suppliers, I, and, I, and what I just said is, is in different bits and parts in my brain, but I, I need to, I'm realizing as we're sitting here having this conversation that I don't have the time while talking to go make these links and, and, and connect these things, but I need to connect the IBM story, um, which goes back to a guy named Bob LeBlanc, Robert LeBlanc, who I interviewed way back in the day, 
<clears throat> who was part of uh, this IBM open source thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I will stop the sharing and think about how I will weave that later, but I think Ken is looking for the floor. And you're, there you go. Actually, I, I, I wasn't, but, but I, I will say something. Oh, good. <laughs> um, there's one other piece that, that comes up for me, which is who's deserving, right? As you were talking about commons and you know, everybody gets to benefit, there's a really big pushback from the right on, I'm not giving those lazy people who don't work anything, right? And um, this is another one of those uh, polarizing uh, things that comes into play in economics. So if we create a system where everybody benefits, there'll be free riders, there'll be people who will not do, contribute anything, and I'm not willing to do that. And so how do we cope with that? And, and that might actually get into profitability because the flip side of that is, Who's deserving of being a billionaire? What are these people who are raking in billions of dollars actually contributing in terms of real value to the economy or to the world? So there, it's the two sides things around who's deserving, which uh, I think is an interesting question to, to pose. Lovely. Um, anyone else want to start with an answer to that? Tom? Yeah. Um, this just kind of connects a couple of things that have come up earlier. and. Um, human behavior is really kind of, you understand the environment in which people operate, you understand a lot about how they might behave. And as I frame the world, I think we have our social environment, natural environment, the political environment, but I've been lately thinking about the, the, uh, the environment of the ideas that are circulating, or the new sphere, or so, you know, the idea sphere, we need a good word for this. But there are certain emergent ideas that change behavior. Um, a non-market world idea is a great reframing of getting us to think differently. And bringing it to this idea of who is deserving, we, and, and I, I've uh, been looking at a book called uh, The Age of Responsibility. And we reframed what responsibility means very uh, quietly over the last few years, starting with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and everybody. Whereas we used to have this more communal, at least in the United States, idea of responsibility for each other. And we've reframed that to responsibility for oneself. And personal responsibility has become the meme that's really created all this idea that you're only deserving if you are personally responsible for yourself. If you are unemployed, it's probably because you didn't work hard enough or you're not looking for a job or you didn't try in school. Whereas, you know what? There are certain structural issues that can cause the hard workers to be very, very unlucky. And so we've taken this idea of a social safety net and said it's not for those who have this idea of bad luck. And he, and he talks about diff, two different forms of luck. There's the kind of gambler's luck, right? We take a shot, uh, we put all our money in the stock market and we lose. Well, that was an intentional thing. But what about the unlucky idea that you've gotten cancer or you, you, know, you have un the inability to work anymore due to an injury? We are, not, we are taking the social network away, a safety net away from each other right now. It's becoming a very, very insidious idea. So if we were to think about what are those ideas right now that are circulating, that if we simply change a few of them, we could help each other reframe what is economics? How do we behave in a way that looks out for each other and for those future generations that were mentioned earlier? Um, we have some very bad ideas right now that are causing very bad behavior. And how sustainable are these bad ideas? The problem is, very, very difficult to, to change an, uh, a dominant idea. The idea that we have business as the solution to everything right now is really a bad idea. It's what makes us elect a business leader to be president as opposed to a political leader. You know, mm -hmm. we have this idea that business is the solution to everything. Uh, Anand talks about this. He goes, why do we believe that the solution to all our social problems is entrepreneurialism? You know, it's creating a new company or a better company. What happened to the idea that politics is how we help each other? What are the other social institutions besides business? But the, the idea that the business meme has overtaken many different domains is perhaps one of the roots of all these problems that we have. I, I completely agree, Tom. And I, I, I moved to a couple different thoughts in my brain here that I think feed what you're saying. Uh, Gordon Gecko. Uh, in the movie Wall Street, played by Michael Douglas, of course, 
uh, one of, unfortunately, Michael Douglas is one of those people who you can almost tell when his movies were shot because he's always using a cell phone and they're huge. Anyway, um, but this whole, this whole trope of greed is good is a, is a really perfect encapsulation. I call it a, a successful meme. And I put it under the conservative capitalist point of view that says that successful capitalists deserve to keep what they make because they spend it. Tax cuts create jobs, trickle down economics. Uh, without the threat of starvation, nobody would work. Uh, people don't value what they don't pay for. Uh, everyone benefits from markets and no protectionism. So I've been collecting up all the different ways in which sort of capitalism tends to see the world. And the American dream is pretty aligned with this sort of capitalist point of view. Uh, the, it's because America is sort of seen as the, the roots of capitalism, even, even though it really isn't. Then I, I've also connected this before to possessive individualism, which is kind of what we're talking about here, which I guess goes back to uh, C.B. McPherson. I don't remember putting him in here, but he's a political scientist and a philosopher at University of Toronto, because well, I do uh, Toronto, Hughes University of Toronto and Toronto faculty. And um, this idea of possessive individualism led to things like the Reagan revolution and Thatcherism, right? Uh, in fact, I don't think I have, I think Thatcher comes after Reagan, right? So I have, oh, that's interesting. How do I not have Thatcherism? That's very strange. Um, I'll just do something amusing for you for one moment here. So I've got Margaret Thatcher, obviously. Um, what I don't seem to have here, I've got neoliberalism under her. I'm gonna include Thatcherism, I think that's spelled right. And uh, now I will connect that to the Reagan revolution over here but then I'm gonna connect it to a very fun thought in my brain called isms. And if I go to isms, this is a bit of a digression. Actually, we're seeing it better right from where I was <clears throat> because here, these are sibling thoughts. Uh, this scrolling list on the right, these are siblings of the current active thought. So they're, they're common children of isms. So here's anti-intellectualism, anti-authoritarianism, uh, anti-Semitism, Arianism, asceticism, associationalism, atavism, atheism, atomism. So if we go to atheism, there's a whole bunch of things around atheism. And here's articles about atheism, et cetera, et cetera. End of digression. Back to uh, greed is good. And I will cede the floor to whoever else would like to jump in. So I'm just wanting to go back a couple of uh, points about uh, <clears throat> freeloading and you know, people who don't work don't deserve anything. I just want to make a couple of points and then I think they just data points as pins on the conversation more than any opinions here. So one is, uh, you know, if, I, if we go back to the conversation of how does nature handle abundance. So if you look at uh, nature, it's not doing only the good stuff. So if you look around, you see in the forest, you have weeds, which are not really good from somebody's point of view. If it's in your garden, then you want to weed it out. But in, in the forest, the weed, weed is needed as a part of the ecosystem or the ecology. Uh, similarly, you have uh, parasites. The most beautiful orchids in the world are actually parasite plants. So that's the way nature looks at it. And we, you know, in our constructs of governance, in our constructs of, uh, as of the isms, we try to come up with our own worldview and judgments as to what is right and what is wrong. And therefore, there becomes, a, uh, I think that we get, a, get skewed into one or the other and the balance then gets shifted. So that's one data point that's coming to my mind. I thought, let's bring, bring that on, uh, on the page. The second thing I think is a little bit more uh, important for me, and this goes back to part of the experience of being in a startup and, uh, you know, what happens in, a, in, in startups typically is that you start with a great deal of enthusiasm. And soon enough, uh, if you're kind of successful, then you see that you've got revenues coming in, you see growth happening, and then you find lots of uh, dissatisfied uh, promoters and employees because most of them feel that they did all the heavy lifting and the other guys were freeloaders. And that brings me to the point that actually that happens only because you want to take, uh, you want to make a judgment or you want to do a review on a timestamp chart you're not looking at a continuum. You're just looking at a time snapshot, right? 
And I think that becomes the bigger problem. So if we start looking at it as a continuum, I think something in our heads will tell us that you can actually go forward with an abundance mindset and not worry about what you think are freeloaders at that point of time. And maybe, you know, they have a different set of things of value that they can bring in along the continuum. And therefore, that becomes a very, a very uh, more, much more sustainable model of abundance in my point of view. Agreed. Uh, one of the interesting dilemmas <clears throat> of common, managing commons is how do, you, how do you deal with people who are trying to freeload or who are taking advantage of the commons or, uh, or whatever? or who are plundering the commons. And it's a really hard issue. So this is, this is not an easy thing. And, and Ostrom's principles of managing a commons try to say, hey, devolve authority to the people closest to the commons, set up boundaries so that you know how the commons is being used and not used, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole, there's a series of eight principles for managing an effective commons. Um, but one of the things that I've come across, and the reason I, I have something I call design from trust, is that if you mistrust everybody, you will design a system that restricts everybody's actions exactly. so that, so that yes. you can police them and control them over time. And what you do when you do that is you cut away the abundance of genius that's actually in the room. You create this weird artificial scarcity by trying to control everybody's actions. So one of the side effects of trying to build top-down command and control systems that will get rid of bad actors is that you actually get rid of good actors as well. You, you, you eliminate the freedom to do good things in the community and with the community. And this education is my favorite example here of, of uh, I, I talk about the ways that education, the education bureaucracy and system creates scarcity. And one of the, my favorite examples here is the Texas school board. And it turns out that there used to be thousands and thousands of school boards around the US when we industrialized education between the US Civil War and the World War I, we basically consolidated those school boards and now the Texas school board is a major one. Most of the other school boards don't have enough resources to analyze textbooks and all that. And so they follow whatever the Texas school board says. And once every five years, they, they do each of the major subjects. So sciences, math, humanities, whatever. Which means once every five years, uh, uh, Macmillan and Pearson and whoever are the big textbook publishers are either going to sell a whole lot of a textbook or zero or, or very few. And guess who figured this out? Conservatives. And so of the 15 members of the Texas School Board, 10 are very conservative and they're busy destroying the content of these textbooks and, and turning them into like pablum and of course kids don't want to read these textbooks. They're boring as hell and they don't have any controversy, anything interesting in them. And, and the idea that we can limit what somebody should, should study from is crazy to me anyway. And so, so that's just a little aspect of scarcity inside of a system, inside of a bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you start from an assumption of trust for the participants in any system, you then let the system, then you have to be very smart about how you help the system come to making good choices about managing its commons, dealing with membership, trusting the members and earning your way up sort of some ladder of trust, the way apprentices do in a guild, for example. There's a whole series of models here around the world, and we're busy trying to figure all that stuff out, including run a democracy sort of, you know, at least in name, along the way. And if you look at Britain and the Brexit, you're like, ah, um, and the U.S. is like right at the beginning of its next big electoral cycle, which is absolutely fascinating. And yet we have all these systems of control that don't actually liberate the genius that's already in the room, if you believe that, as an opening assumption. So that's a great point you've made. And I think, you know, if one, if one were to look at it a little bit more uh, in depth, one would wonder as to why do you have, especially in the education and the primary school or the school system, uh, we call these uh, kids as bad actors because they're disruptive and they're dis disrupting what's already in place. One, one never looks at why is it that their energies are not being used. It's because they're bored. They're bored about uh, with whatever is being doled out to them, right? And so, uh, on, on a much lighter note, you know, when when I was a kid, I still remember. I go back. Uh, I mean, that's a long, long time ago, as you guys can. Couple see. years. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so. 
So the, uh, the smartest of the teachers uh, would actually take the bad actors and make them monitors of the classroom, right? So their energy then gets channelized, they get the importance that they need. So if we, if we were trying to take a leaf out of that book, then we have a very different way to look at bad actors and freeloaders, right? You kind of shift the responsibility onto them and then design from trust and see where, where you can take the whole thing. And I, and I think that sharing those kinds of stories is incredibly important because any community, any group of people trying to do something together needs to establish their own norms and their own patterns and their own methods themselves. If, they're, if these things are poured onto them, they don't own them, they don't care, and they're not necessarily going to obey. So part of what we need is a rich environment of stories like the one you just told, and then you experiment with them, right? And maybe that works, maybe something else works, who knows? But, but how, one, of, one of the questions I love is, how can you co-opt bad actors and turn them into good actors? So on Wikipedia, for example, and I think this is very different now, but when Wikipedia was young, if you were a 14 year old boy, what more fun could there be than to go in and vandalize Wikipedia and like replace a page with images nobody should see and whatever else. But Wikipedians would greet you when you made a change with, hey, I see you were trying to edit this. That's not quite how we do this. Please go look at this page for, you know, the, the, the norms we've established. But, you know, can I help you be a better participant? And an invitation based on trust into the community that offers you a way to ladder up and learn how the community works, and then to, to be exposed to these stories about what actually works for us and what works in other places is incredibly important. And most of our systems don't do that. Um, and and I'll, I'll point here to, uh, just for, for fun, Oscar Wilde has a famous quote, you know, I, I'd love, and I'm gonna paraphrase it badly, but you know, I'm interested in socialism, but I also want my evenings. <laughs> is like this stuff takes conversation, it takes engagement, it takes work, it takes the building of trust, it takes all these kinds of things that we've excised from our society because we're supposed to be able to consume our way to everything just by using our wallet and buying stuff. And it turns out that that doesn't really lead to happiness, it turns out that that leads to affluenza, which is you know the disease of having too much. All those kinds of things are now completely symptoms of the society we live in. And, and we've lost a lot of it. And, and fortunately, the people in this Zoom are aware of a lot of the antidotes. And, and that's, that's part of why I think we're here having this conversation is that, is that we care a lot about like Umberto Maturana and a bunch of other uh, really great thinkers who've, uh, who've figured out how a lot of these things should fit together, uh, Lynn Ostrom and others. So uh, we're getting close to the end of our call time and I wanna make room for- yeah, I, think, my I think the millennials, the, the younger kids actually were much more wanting to understand profitability more than abundance. And I don't think we got there. So uh, we to you, know, you know what? We could have another call. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <clears throat> and we could start from profitability on the next call because I think we needed to turn this soil a lot. But, but I just would love to hear from, from you three and, and uh, any thoughts, including how, how to frame another call, if you'd, if you'd like to do one, I'd be very happy to do one just like this next week or week after. I would support another call and perhaps in between in the blog that we have um, put in subtopics under abundance because this is such a rich and complex area that it connects to many other things. And there's, there's several subsets that we've covered today that could be explored more fully and I'm particularly interested in individual and collective um, actions or executions that occur, could occur to move us more along the trajectory we believe would be productive. Thank you. I've been thinking uh, lately about the problem of uh, the collective form of the corporation as being part of the problem, especially with limited liability. Limited liability seems to me at its core, taking something away from society and making it disappear. Some kind of responsibility. That is, so you can amass capital to do things with no sense of the consequences. And there's something deep there, which I don't understand yet that I'd like to see get into the conversation. Love that. Just another thing, uh, I completely agree with that and I, I love the thoughts 
that are flowing and just something that I was thinking about is while we were doing this, I was kind of listing um, themes that have, if you add abundance to them, where they've led to. So like information plus abundance has less led to open source and like um, skills and abundance has less led to um, labor on demand, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I was just thinking an interesting thing to do over a call or however, would be to kind of think of what systems abundance has already, the abundance mindset has already allowed us to create or where we've headed, which of these systems are working or have worked um, and which really need transformation. So I know like um, where Jerry, we're already talking about education uh, and how much still needs to be done. And so if we could identify more such more systems or systems that are completely untouched by the abundance mindset, um, it might help us to like look, go beyond just like the realm of thought and conversation and also then start looking at actionable points. That sounds, <clears throat> that sounds awesome. And um, I'll just do a really quick screen share because I collect up a lot of these sorts of things and I'll just give you uh, where to look. Um, so I have a thought called examples of the relationship economy in action. I will share a link directly to this thought right now when, when I stop sharing my screen here, but I'm busy collecting up, you know, free and open knowledge, uh, direct contributions, un un unconditional cash transfers, which are sort of a form of universal basic income. Uh, simple things like co-locating daycare with elder care in some cities, they do that. Uh, the notion of commoning, which David Bollier is a big fan of. All of these things um, point to places, communities, groups, movements that are in fact harnessing, I think, abundance mindset and trust. And I, I think there's also for me an interesting intersection here between trust and abundance that, that I should explore uh, more on these calls as we go forward. So let me add that, uh, let me add that to where we are. So here's, the, here's, that, uh, here's that link. I was finding, Jerry, that the question that I had posed earlier about what is the complementary piece to abundance through the chat and just everything everyone's been saying, it just seems to keep going back to the concept of trust and how that ties in. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Which is why I think trust is so central. I, well, obviously, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, Logan, did you want to jump in? Yeah. After all this, and first, thanks for this. This was an extremely interesting uh, experience and true to the name of the project, it does quite a lot feel like jumping in and out of your brain, which is a, a really lovely experience that you don't normally get. Um, but the, and I, I love the hand waving too. I, I've never seen that before and I think it's phenomenal. This means um, I agree. This means I disagree, by the way. Wait, which one I need to- Fingers down. Me, yeah. Oh, that's Fingers, disagree. Jazz hands that's down agree. means no, I disagree. Yeah. This is like, eh, and this is, is yeah. means that wh whoever's saying whatever they're saying right now, I agree. Sorry, go ahead. So you've, got, you've got at least like four more dimensions of, of digital expression here that you could go, you could go up and anyways. The, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, after, after all this, um, uh, and maybe this maps to uh, how you organize your brain, which is both associative and dissociative in that um, it's, there are hierarchies and then there are dishierarchies and it's, it's un you know, it doesn't fit within a, a tree nor should it, though my brain tends to default to that tree. And so as a result, after this call, I'm thinking about how I fit uh, a sort of a, um, a collectively exhaustive definition of abundance. So is the abundance mindset something that we uh, can create in ourselves and then try and bring to a marketer in interaction? Or is it the result of having the right norms that govern a marketer interaction? And we kind of jump back and forth between those two. Um, is abundance as a state um, what happens after we decide on a particular threshold of satisfaction or happiness with what we're willing to, to give ourselves? And we live within stasis within that, which is kind of the, the ecological metaphor. Or is abundance uh, forever pushing out the frontier of what we can have ourselves through I think what we mostly went back and forth between was sort of technological productivity, the ability to create, you know, ideas and markets out of nothing. Um, so I, I find myself really interested in trying to figure out what the right definition is. Love that. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, um, and, and, and you're opening up a bunch of really fun Pandora's boxes. For example, 
um, there are people we talk about you know carrying capacity is a, is a common term for ecosystems and people say that if you know if we keep doing what we're doing we're going to need seven earths we're already beyond the carrying capacity of the current earth and i'm like you know what humans are good for the landscape humans who know what they're doing actually make the earth better humans who are screwing it up can can destroy it like that but i think we have plenty of leeway to feed many more people if we happen to have more people, et cetera. I, I, my own take is that if we did things better, right, that a lot of the sort of the, the boundary conditions are, are in fact flexible, that we could act, you know, do a lot better. It's just that we behave so terribly that we're probably going to make ourselves extinct. Um, but th that's a whole other sort of a series of, of conversations. And, and, and yeah, I think it's a good, good conversation to have. Um, and uh, Mayanka, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just kind of uh, to also thank you for a very interesting afternoon. I had no idea what I was kind of getting into and this has been phenomenal. Um, so uh, just kind of to add on some thoughts that are kind of in my head and I'm sure we'll kind of take it up in future conversations were kind of around the idea of adding over to things. And so kind of similar to what Ishta was doing in terms of making combinations, but also abundance related to kind of ideas of over wealth or kind of overworking or over time, but kind of also these kind of ideas around having like too many choices and kind of, of course, the example that is relatable to most people is going on Netflix and, you know, spending an hour just trying to decide what to watch and then being too exhausted to actually watch anything. Um, but just kind of what that does to kind of the hollowness of choice, what that does to kind of conscience, ability to make any kind of informed decision or informed choice uh, but also what that that does in larger sense to like our ideas around politics justice um, and other kind of conversations for which we completely lose anchor because of the kind of you know a similar idea of abundance which is also related to kind of the idea of spectacle which is something I'd love to kind of pick up at some point because I do feel like that's a term that relates to a lot of things we've been talking about um, and opens up lots of other interesting conversations. I love that. Um, so a couple thoughts. One is um, Inside Jerry's Bain is a series of calls over time. Uh, there's a little mailing list I can put you on if you'd like to be part of the conversation and get the notices for each call. And rather than, rather than say, let's have another call like this, what I'd love to do is invite you to help steer the calls and be on as many, you know, be on as many calls as you want, but let's pick from this list of topics that we're talking about um, and, and just structure a few more calls. And as we go into each topic, <clears throat> Let's think of who else we'd like to invite into the conversation, it, we, including experts, authors, whatever else. I mean, we have a really broad network. We have a lot of reach from the people who are in the room, so we can we can go deeper into subsets of this as we want to. That that's pretty easy to do. So I just want to make that offer uh, because I'm very happy to do that, and I think it would be a really worthwhile journey for us. So so uh, if you don't mind, I'll put your names on the Inside Jury's Brain Google group. It's a Google group, so it's just a simple mailing list that'll show up in your email. And then let's use, let's use that to have this conversation and figure out, all right, great. So what topics? And then let, we'll just pick days and times for, for these things. We'll make them early on the, on the West Coast so that you guys can make it there. Or um, if, if, you know, if it's really late my time, like 9 p.m., it's early your morning. So that could work as well. Um, we'll, we'll move things around so that we can uh, adapt to different people. Uh, any other uh, closing thoughts from anybody? I think we uh, missed a core part of the problem of abundance, which it starts with a farmer who, who grows more, which lowers the price of what he can sell it for. So the incentives are really off and we don't have a way of managing that boundary. Um, so overproduction leads to lower price, leads to crises in different sorts of markets in, in different ways. And I think there's a, an interesting thing there. Um, huh. uh, somebody, I think it might've been Tom mentioned Against the Grain earlier in the conversation, the book by James Scott, which is a book I love. Um, I really got a lot from it. And, and he's trying to study, um, he's trying to study this boundary between uh, the first cities and hunter gatherers or, you know, the, the he, and he's studying basically the Marsh Arabs who were in the Tigris and Euphrates uh, area and the first cities of Ur and Uruk. Uh, and, and he's trying to break our conventional wisdom that civilization with a capital C shows up when we domesticate the major grains. 
And he says, look, there were 4,000 years between the domestication of grains and the first city-states. We resisted being roped into city-states. And he, he talks about walls often being used to hold people in as opposed to keep people out <clears throat> in different ways. It's super interesting. And that people in cities suffered malnutrition much more than people who lived out on the land because people who lived out on the land had a much more diverse diet. Uh, and people who lived in cities were often just getting grains and a few other things that made it into the markets or whatever else. Um, and interesting side note, um, why grains? Why the four major grains, rice, corn, uh, wheat and uh, barley, I think. Uh, why four grains? A, they grow above ground so you can see the crop. B, they ripen at the same time so there is a harvest festival, a harvest season, and the tax guy knows exactly who harvested how much when. Three, they're portable. Once I winnow it and get the grain down and they store for a while, minus what the rats and the, and the, and the uh, rabbits eat, uh, so he, he basically makes the proposition that the, the four grains were really a benefit to tax, tax authorities, meaning kings and queens and rulers, and that, that those people drove the rest of us to make grains for that reason. And potatoes are much more nutritious, like, but they grow on the, I, you can't tell where the potato crop is easily. And you can pick a potato out of the ground at any moment, right? So, gosh, not so much potatoes, although there's a whole separate interesting history of potatoes. But all of these things are part of really basic functioning assumptions we have that I, that I want to also try to upset or at least try to contradict in our conversations. Because the more we free up the idea that we weren't stupid way back when and that we weren't starving way back when, we weren't entirely violent with each, with each other way back when, the more we can reach back and find what was really useful from that ancient wisdom and use it again, which is one of the big questions I want to talk about as well in this series, which is how do we mix the best of the old with the best of the new? And, and to me, that's a really big part of this quest is how do we pick up, <clears throat> and we didn't all die by 40. Exactly. There were really old people way back when. It's just that infant mortality was pretty high. So there was a dumbbell shaped distribution, but if you made it past a certain age, you are very likely to make it into a ripe old age, right? So super interesting. There's, there's all these stupid assumptions we have about what life was like. I think I need to like collapse some of that stuff a little bit better in my brain as well, because I'm not sure I have all these different things I just said. I don't think I have them unified in one place. So I'll go do that. Anyway, um, this has been a big treat for me and uh, hopefully enjoyable for you. Let's make more of a series of it. And um, um, thank you. I appreciate it. Until our next call. Thanks. Take Bye, care. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank everybody. <laughs>